just why people are coming in. Um, um, we're, uh, we've had, I think, uh, what I would say is a good um, first year of our Center for Global Health Equity. Um, kind of a crazy year uh, with COVID and our restrictions on travel to try and, um, and launch a center. Uh, one of the big priorities for us has been on uh, developing um, uh, a community of practice and to try and look at um, thematic areas that would bring us together across the university to build on our strengths and to really think meaningfully about impact. And, uh, uh, and this seminar series has been one of those processes. So um, we're gonna go ahead and get started with uh, this evening's session. And again, my name is Joe Kolars and I'm the director for our Center for Global Health Equity. And uh, we're gonna be uh, recording uh, this session. Um, this is often uh, uh, kind of a smaller intimate group as we talk about topics that are relevant to the center. And, um, and please um, contribute to the conversation uh, through the chat group, adding questions. Um, we've designed these seminars to have uh, a bit of presentation, um, but I think the most important part of the seminar is always the dialogue and the things and the ideas that get triggered by uh, the conversation. Um, I'd like to introduce um, the leader of uh, this evening's seminar, uh, Professor Bill Axon. Um, Bill has been um, with the university for over 20 years, a professor of sociology, a number of leadership roles in the uh, Institute for Social Research. Um, I've been impressed with the places he's been uh, within our university community, which kind of aligns with my conversations with him where he's been throughout life. Um, Bill is a bit of a citizen of the world, having lived in a number of different um, countries and continents and has a very refreshing um, view when thinking about um, global initiatives. Um, I think those of us who are too anchored in North America or in one country often get collaborations wrong. But I've been particularly impressed um, hearing Bill reflect on the work that he's been a part of that I know he'll uh, speak about in terms of a team with his work in Nepal in the Chitwan Initiative. Um, why are we asking Bill to share this conversation this evening? One of the things we're trying to do as a center is we're trying to think about how can we uh, better engage with platforms of activity um, in different parts of the world. Platforms where we hope to be relevant, where we can listen to the communities, where we can be informed, where we can co-design for impact. Well, when we're starting with those kinds of aspirations, why not turn to those who have got great depth and experience? Um, for many of us, the Nepal platform that you're gonna hear about is one great example of uh, of a platform that's been designed to engage with the community, to co-design, to try and take data and assign meaning to it. And if there's one thing that global health is really focusing on right now is trying to make meaning out of data. There seems to be a ton of data out there. There seems to be less attention to making meaning out of the data that's out there. And we see that as a space that we could and should work on with the center. So um, Bill is gonna be introducing uh, team members um, throughout the course of the presentation. But um, um, Bill, Stephanie, Durga, thank you for uh, sharing your wisdom and knowledge and seeding what I hope is a, is a good discussion uh, that will help us understand more about what you've done there in Nepal, but help us to extract those lessons to um, inform what we uh, should be doing elsewhere. So um, 
Bill, um, I'll turn that over to you. And I, I, uh, I think you're gonna be going to screen share and I'll maintain an active role as a facilitator and moderator. Uh, Joe, can you see my screen okay? Yes, thank you, Bill, looks good. So uh, Joe uh, oversold, uh, I, I, I hope I can at least meet the seed, seed of conversation, which I, I think will be the most useful part. Um, Joe asked us to speak on the topic of, of data systems for longitudinal population research. And so we're going to focus on that. Um, okay, now I'm sharing my screen, but uh, there we go. Uh, and, and we're going to do it in three parts. Uh, each of us will take a part. I'll speak uh, about the Chitwan Valley Family Study in Nepal. And uh, then Stephanie will speak about data systems that support coordinated panel studies. And then Deirdre will talk about some of the benefits of longitudinal research in Nepal. And we're going to try and, and be um, efficient. One topic that Joe and I spoke about that I thought was important to address was my perception of some of the key differences between longitudinal uh, studies and demographic surveillance systems. And it's a bit of a caricature on my part of de demographic surveillance systems, but um, I, I hope this caricature of both will serve its purpose for seeding our discussion. That is, I see demographic surveillance systems as primarily about a defined place, tracking events among the residents of that place, but not uh, getting data from people who move away from that place. Whereas I see longitudinal studies of individuals as um, studies of a defined set of people, usually from a place at selection, but then tracking events among those people. And people are followed wherever they move, even outside of the place. Um, I, I, I want to um, now focus on what I think are some of the key benefits of um, of uh, panel in longitudinal panel studies uh, for for uh, our research, uh, the biggest one I think is that it supports individual level causal inference, and I think this is true uh, particularly because by tracking individuals and the events that happen to them over time, it allows us to measure the the timing of events and uh, sort the temporal order of what's come first, second, and third, and so forth for studies of cause and consequence. And this is particularly helpful uh, for the study of factors that cannot be randomly assigned. So I, I know that randomization is quite the rage and all, all over the world, and it's great for some kinds of evaluations. But for some of the things we study, um, in, in my world, uh, uh, pregnancies, divorces, and marriages, um, in, in my friend Pam Jagger's world, uh, perhaps air pollution, uh, you don't get to randomly assign it. Um, and, uh, and, and I think because of these advantages for studying the temporal sequence of events and getting causal inference from that temporal sequence, panels, individual level longitudinal studies have become one of the key cornerstones of population studies as a science. I also believe that they can be used to make place level inferences. And I'll talk briefly about that as well. Uh, the case study we're going to focus on today is the Chitwan Valley Family Study from Nepal. It focuses on more than 10,000 individuals and it follows them through their entire uh, lifetime. It tracks all immigrants no matter where they uh, go and it features a multi-level design that includes community context across seven decades. Uh, Joe wanted me to give you a little bit of background about the Chitwan Valley Family Study. Uh, and I'm delighted to do that, and we'll be happy to tell you more during the discussion if you like. The, the study itself was motivated by, by two key sets of things. One was understanding the causes of family change, and by family change here, I mean marriage timing and courtship, childbearing and contraceptive use, divorce and relationship quality, and migration and living arrangements, and understanding the consequences of those kind of family changes for things like change in the natural environment, mental health of individuals, child health of children in those families, and changes in household income and assets. Uh, as Joe and I talked about doing this, he asked me to represent sort of the key values upon launch of the, of the study, which was in 1994-95. And I, I, I wanted to boil it down to this single um, key principle. 
which was to never choose a less rigorous approach. And as Joe mentions, I, I had had some background living in four countries before this, and I decided I never wanted to allow the poor country setting to motivate an approach that was somehow less rigorous than we might use in the United States or Europe. I wanted to employ the approaches used in the very best longitudinal studies in rich countries. And, and even within that set of values, I wanted to make sure we were always designing setting specific measures and measurement tools so that we're measuring appropriate for the local context, even while trying to hold to these values. And I was very fortunate uh, to at a young age uh, find uh, uh, Dr. Gamiri uh, when he was also young and we agreed on this principle and, and that helped us frame the Chihuahua Valley Family Study. This is the setting for the study. Uh, this is the picture from the Chitwan Valley in Nepal. It's uh, nestled in the Himalayas, but only about uh, 400 feet above sea level and very flat, as you can see. I wanted to tell you just some key design characteristics of the study. Uh, the CBFS longitudinal design follows all members of every baseline household. Uh, so all they have to do is be in our baseline study, which took place in 19, was, was actually, uh, the census was done in 1995 and the first baseline interview was done in 1996. And then they were followed after that. Uh, anybody else who marries one of those people or is born to one of those people becomes a member of the panel study. Uh, and that makes it sort of a full family design. And then each person is tracked no matter where the person moves to any place inside Nepal or any place outside of Nepal and interviewed where they are. And in addition, we gathered full family histories with each individual followed in and out of existing households. I wanted to comment on, uh, in addition to that panel of individuals following them over time to get the, the sequence of events in their lives, the registry system that we use to keep track of those households and we use to keep track of the specific places where we selected those households from. Uh, this registry system goes to every household in one of the selected neighborhoods and, and counts everybody there for each month. And it gets continuous place specific measurement of demographic events with monthly precision, births, marriages, divorces, moves in, moves out, deaths, and school enrollment. And so this part is very much like a demographic surveillance system. We switched this to computer assisted personal interviewing or CAPI in 2009. And Stephanie will show you more about not just what that is, but why we did that. And this place-based continuous measurement gives us a tool that we can then use to refresh the, the CVFS longitudinal panel we do this approximately once per decade to make sure it continues to be representative of the place as well as tracking people over time. And the last big point I wanted to make about the design was about what we call attrition. This is the, the biggest uh, well-known threat to studies of this type is that you'll lose people over time. Huron Valley Family Study has done very well by uh, keeping track of everyone. We, we keep 98% uh, of the households uh, every 10 years. We have more than 92% of the individuals remaining in the CVFS uh, each 10 years. Um, and there are a couple of tactics that have proved very successful for this purpose. One is this regular cycle of contacting the households. We do it every six months and we get data on all the events in the households. Another is the use of extensive uh, contact people, other family members to help us locate people who have moved. And the third is a, a mixture of in-person and telephone design, this kind of mixed mode uh, contact design has uh, really become, gosh, I would say the standard of operation for most longitudinal studies worldwide. And uh, this was important for us because there was an armed conflict during the period we were in the field. And so we've published these methods around that topic if you wanna take more, more look on that. Um, with with uh, with that, Steph, I think this is your turn, right? Wait a second. Yes, that's yes. my first time. Okay, let me introduce Stephanie to you. Uh, Stephanie Shardul is the Director of Survey Research Operations at the University of Michigan Survey Research Center. And she has an extensive background in international data collection operations with many different studies. 
And my favorite example of that is the World Mental Health Surveys, which are done in over 40 different countries. And one of the reasons that's such an important example is it highlights the value of having a consistent set of tools used simultaneously so that you can generate data that can be compared across places. Something that I think uh, dramatically increases the value of data you get from any one particular context. Staff, with that introduction, all yours. Thanks. So I think it's probably well known that using computer assisted data collection methods increases your quality and reduces especially interviewer introduced error to the data collection. Um, but almost more importantly, the computer assisted tools provide paradata and paradata is information about the process of collecting the data. So things like interviewer ID, location of the interview, timing data from the survey, outcome of every contact attempt that an interviewer makes with an individual or a household. All of that is considered paradata, which is captured by these systems and is critical to creating this high quality management tool. So these tools reduce both error and bias. And at the Survey Research Center, we are able to use these technical tools and these methods that we have developed to partner with research teams all over the world to help them apply best practices and survey methodology and survey design, but especially helping our partners to create these tools and these systems that allow them to collect these high quality data. And I list some of our you know, current and most recent collaborations here on the slide. Oh, next. <laughs> so everywhere, but especially when um, you are collecting data in poor countries or areas where there are not the same level of resources that we have here in the US, the goal is to optimize both quality and cost. And the way to do that is to use these tools to focus on measurement quality. So in many of these um, partners around the world, the organizations don't have appropriate tools to, to implement quality control and quality assurance programs. Um, they don't have the financial tools, they don't have the um, skills, the background, the methodological knowledge and the technical expertise. So we partner with them to provide um, QC and quality assurance um, at three different levels. One is the survey product, and this is basically the survey questionnaire or the data capture system that is collecting the data. The survey process, which includes everything from interviewer recruitment and training to defining a robust protocol for the field work to collecting the data, to recording everything about the data collection, and to have a sophisticated sample management system that allows you to integrate all of this information. And then at the organizational level, helping to make sure that our partners have sufficient infrastructure to implement all of these um, systems and tools. So the reduction of error or bias um, is essential to creating these high quality data sets um, and especially to reduce issues around these key areas, um, making sure that you can detect problems in the population, measuring sometimes very small subgroup differences, measuring change over time and program effects, um, and sometimes the detection of these differences or changes, the, the changes are so small that you need to have many cases, high quality data. And so these tools allow you to do that so that you actually can evaluate these policies or these programs. Thanks. So there are many benefits of a computer assisted interviewing system 
and I'm going to highlight the ones that are um, most relevant to longitudinal data collection. So the CVFS household registry data collection that Bill just described, for years, interviewers would collect this highly precise monthly level data for every individual in a household, recording these data on big paper sheets and then transferring data from sheets to sheets as they go through these different waves of data collection. And so implementing a computer assisted system allowed us to directly enter the data into the CAPI system and then to directly export those data and preload them into the next wave. And you can imagine the amount of error and time um, that that system saved. It also allows you to preload information from previous wave surveys, which makes data collection more efficient when there are elements of the questionnaire that the interviewer can simply confirm with the respondent rather than re-asking the same questions over and over, um, wave after wave. Many of these longitudinal studies have very complex sample eligibility rules and inclusion rules and exclusion rules, and those can all be programmed into your computer-assisted system so that interviewers are asking the questions of the household, entering the information, but are not in the position of needing to make these highly technical decisions about who should be included, who should be excluded. And the system also allows them to generate automatically follow-up interviews when appropriate. And an example of that is with the household registry system. Questions are asked for every individual in a household, if individuals meet certain criteria, then they are asked follow-up questions about marriage or education or childbirth, and the system automatically walks the interviewer through those follow-up questionnaires correctly. Next slide. The system also can walk the interviewer through collecting kind of tangential or additional observations. This may be at the end of the interview, it may be neighborhood observations, it may be, you know, other environmental observations. So the interviewer just, you know, does that as a task within the system. The system allows the interviewer to step through the collection of very systematic contact information. So these high response rates, these high recontact rates that Bill quoted are only possible because you're able to keep track of where respondents are, you're able to have additional information of people who are able to find these respondents and that's all integrated into one system and maintained. And then um, lastly, the important step of generating these paradata that I mentioned earlier. And these paradata come from both the survey questionnaire, the data collected, but also from the sample management system itself. Next slide. So this is just a picture of interviewers at ISERN in Chitwan using our CAPI technology to interview respondents. You can see in very you know, kind of rural situations, um, but they're able to take their laptops and sit down with respondents and administer the questionnaire. And there's a picture of um, one of the items from the questionnaire, which is, you know, they're all translated into Nepali interviewers could um, switch in between English and Nepali or you know, whatever language we are implementing um, on a project. But this is what the interviewer sees and this is how they interact with respondents with their laptops. So a full quality control system um, for production management assumes that you have a robust sample management system that is electronically collecting all of these data as well as a computerized questionnaire that is linked to the sample management system. And the sample management system allows you to assign a caseload to specific interviewers and manage that caseload across interviewers. Interviewers can see their list of available cases, they can transfer cases, they can send cases to a supervisor if they have a question, that's all done within the system. Interviewers are always able to see for their own cases a full history of what's happened on that case, including if you want, to pull in information from previous waves of data that interviewers may want to review before making contact attempts. 
but also managers and supervisors on a study using a management tool can go in and see all of an interviewer's sample lines, the history of each of those sample lines, can run reports on those. And it's almost real time. Um, the data are as good as, you know, as often as interviewers transmit data from their laptop to a centralized server. You're allowed to link in things such as GPS location. You can attach that to sample lines within the system and confirm that interviewers are where they should be for a sampled household. You can collect timestamps from the questionnaire to look at individual interviewers, how they move through the survey, if there are problem uh, questions within a survey, if some interviewers are outliers um, as they're moving through the survey administration. And of course, the survey management system links with the questionnaire or the survey data, packages it all, and transmits all of those data from the interviewer's laptop to the centralized server. So this is a picture of the sample management system that we use in SRC and that we modify for use by our international partners. Um, you can see that this is um, the labels and the keywords here have been translated into Nepali for the ISCRN interviewers. This screen is what an interviewer sees when she opens up her laptop and sees her entire caseload. So each row is a sample line or an individual on a project that the interviewer is assigned. The interviewer can highlight these rows and in the bottom half of the screen, they get some summary information about that sample line. The next screen shows if an interviewer has selected a sample line, this is a full history of all of the work that interviewers have done on that sample line for this wave of data collection. And here now the bottom half of the screen is what we call a contact note where the interviewer records the date, time, outcome of a contact attempt and is able to enter a text note about what happened on that contact attempt and assign a final code. And so all of this information is collected and compiled into you know, a master data set for the sample for a project. So in Nepal, again, interviewers used the survey track system to record the outcome of every contact attempt on the project. They would use internet connections to transmit daily to our secure servers here in Ann Arbor. Data are encrypted on the laptop and then sent encrypted to the servers where, inter where data across all of the interviewers are compiled into a master data set for the project. It's this master data set that's made available to managers and supervisors to run reports, to you know, manage the work of the interviewers, to identify problems that may be happening in the field. This is a web-based management tool that can be accessed from anywhere. Um, we, of course, give access to people who need to have access. And so our team at SRC taught the team in Nepal how to use these tools and how to manage their own interviewers and their own data collection throughout the course of the fieldwork. So this is an example of a report that you could get from the survey track system. Each one of these rows here now is an interviewer on a project. You can see in this report how many interviews each interviewer has completed the average number of contact attempts it took each interviewer to complete a survey. And then you can see the average length of the survey. And so here we're able to identify and highlight interviewers that have significantly lower than average survey lengths, which is something a supervisor might want to look into. Um, we can identify interviewers who have higher than average item missing data. You can see here we've in, highlighted an interviewer who has higher both don't know and refusal responses in their surveys. And we can highlight interviewers who have a high number of questions, individual items in the survey that they are asking and answering in less than one second, which is a red flag. Um, you can see most interviewers don't have any of those, but then there are some interviewers that consistently have some of these questions where it looks like they're just you know, speeding through the interview. And so these are cues for the supervisors to look at those interviewers more carefully. 
for one of the studies on the CVFS sample that we did recently was on a mental health prevalence rates. And as part of that survey, we also collected saliva samples, biomarkers from the respondents. We used an integrated logging tool that's integrated with the sample management system to track separately the progress of each of those saliva samples. So every saliva kit was assigned a barcode label. The team in Nepal and Chitwan at ISCRN and the team at the lab we were using in Kathmandu had barcode readers. And down the left hand of the screen here, you can see each step that each saliva sample went through. When the interviewer turned the sample into the main office at ISCRN, when ISCRN sent that saliva sample to the lab in Kathmandu, when the lab received the saliva sample, when they extracted the DNA from the saliva sample. So we are able to see in the same big survey data set the status of each of these saliva samples, which we tracked very carefully all the way to the Broad Institute in Boston, USA from Chitwan Valley. And I can't stand not to make the point that um, this is a tool that's very valuable for connecting measures of physical specimens, water, air, what have you, to measures of human beings. Yeah, it could be used for any type of specimen or sample. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but just again, examples of types of errors or quality control indicators that you can identify through using these paradata reporting tools. And some of these, you can get red flags on single instances. Some of them, you can generate red flags by looking at trends or cumulative indicators in these reports. And so we work with each partner to identify for their specific project which data points make sense to report on and track during the course of a study. This is a different type of report here. These are four different interviewers over four different data collection waves. Um, in this particular instance is STEM questions in a mental health survey. If the respondent endorses a STEM question, they then get asked a long series of questions about that particular disorder. Here we have an interviewer who seems to have learned that if you answer no to those STEM questions, you're able to reduce the overall time of your questionnaire. So supervisors would wanna look at that interviewer more carefully. I'm not going to read all of these conclusions. We can certainly come back to these um, after the end of the presentation, but you, know, you can see there are many benefits of having a robust, high quality, technically integrated data collection system. Um, again, you know, going back on Bill's uh, mention of his value of not you know, choosing less robust approaches for these data collections that are done in um, international settings. Thank you, Stephanie. Let me take a quick minute to introduce Dr. Dirga Gamiri. Um, uh, Dirga is Professor of Population Studies here at the Institute for Social Research and uh, also Director of the Institute for Social and Environmental Research in Nepal. And it's really in that role that he'll be speaking to us today. And, and I wanted you to know that uh, at the time uh, I recruited Dirga to start working on the Chitwan Valley Family Study. He had worked for CARE Nepal for 10 years. And one of the ways I convinced him to make the jump from practice to research was his own frustration at having managed interventions for 10 years for CARE and, uh, and not having the data to evaluate their success and, uh, and, and to shape newer and better ones. And so uh, it's with the background in implementation that he came to uh, the, the study of, or the application of longitudinal research to problems facing Nepal. And then out of that, that he founded the Institute for Social and Environmental Research to really institutionalize those, uh, those uh, 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 benefits. Um, Dirga, uh, you ready? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you, Will. Uh, yes, uh, now what uh, I'm going to talk about is, so why are we doing a longitudinal research and how that benefits to the study population? 
Uh, I, I think there are mainly two ways, and that is generation uh, uh, generate knowledge to foster evidence-based policy formulation, which is a very crucial, uh, especially in low-income countries. And uh, second one is providing opportunity to build local capacity. Uh, I mean, if you go around uh, the world in the low income countries, research capacity in low income country is almost non-existent or very low. So yeah, uh, this is true in the context that numerous individual and organizations are conducting research in low income setting with very good intention of improving lives of people. Among those studies, vast majority are particularly conducted by development partners, such as USAID, World Bank, Asian Development Bank, UNICEF, you, you can name uh, other dozen of those, and generally designed to provide descriptive information about the study population or the problems these population face, such as poverty, health, living condition, which is very nice. I mean, if you want to take some examples, other USAID has been doing, uh, it started with World Fertility Survey and it's still continuing with demographic and health surveys and providing this information to low income countries. I think right now there are 40 countries that have a demographic and health surveys. Next slide, please. These studies have been very successful in providing much needed descriptive statistics, such as fertility rates, prevalence of nutritional deficiency, unemployment, and all sorts of other uh, you know, information to help the you know, government in poor countries to allocate the uh, scare resources. However, they do not provide, I mean, exactly the, this is the point where I got frustrated implementing a, pro, a development program uh, in, in Nepal. However, they do not provide the information to answer the basic questions about causes and consequences across time. Uh, more specifically, what causes the persistent poverty, nutritional deficiency, and unemployment? What are the consequences of the program that are designed to address these problems? That was the main issue. I switched my career from development worker to research. Here I am taking one example of our research and to show how the longitudinal panel studies are helpful to at least uh, address some of the problem. Uh, I'm taking a uh, Butel and Exchange paper, 2002. Uh, based on this paper, this cbfs based data analysis shows that ethnicity and parental education produces substantial disparity in the rates of dropping out of school in Nepal. So basically what happened is low, low, uh, low educated parents, children of the low educated parents it usually drops out of the school mostly. Same way is uh, the minority population, uh, yeah, children from minority household drop out of the schools sooner than the other group. Next slide, please. So building on the uh, Butel and Exchange finding, we then conduct, I mean, we, we knew from that paper, but uh, we don't know why that will happen. So we continue working on the same sample and we then conducted a follow-up study on 50 children who had dropped out of schools. We conducted in-depth interviews with parents, teachers, and those children. And this interview revealed that children whose parents were illiterate and were unable to help the children with their homework were the children most likely to drop out of the schools. Teachers behavior with poor performing children also increased the likelihood of those children dropping out of the school. We learned that. Then next, we summarize these findings in a policy brief. 
and published it and distributed it to both the development partners, the government, and then we, at the same time, we ourselves, we means ISCR and the institute that uh, we founded, also launched a pilot program outside of our sample neighborhood, a uh, pilot program on out of school children. This is a very simple concept and simple, uh, simple uh, program. The main reason the children are dropping out of school was they were not able, their parents were not able to help them to do their homework. And when they go to school without completing their homework, the teachers behave barely towards them. So they, they you know, that triggers the dropping out of, uh, is, uh, I mean, they don't want to go back to the school where the teachers are not behaving well and they could not complete their homework. So they, they you know, most likely to drop out of the school. So what we did is we paid a local per person a small amount of money and then said, can you gather these kids in the morning and help, help them to complete their homework? That's all this, this program is about. Just to help these kids to do their homework so they don't, they don't uh, drop out of school. So um, we launched that program, and then next year we found a very high, high, high success of you know those who dropped out were you know ranking high on their uh, test. So that was very encouraging. And then I myself and our team member conducted series of meetings with uh, planning commission. There is a national planning commission in Nepal that uh, that helps the government to design a policy. So we work with the planning commission, and at the same time, because it is a low income country, do not have much resource. Um, we also work with uh, UNICEF Nepal. So we bring together these two, uh, you know, two partners, and then the and next slide, please. UNICEF and government of Nepal work together to design and implement a out of school children program on a national scale. That's how a, even a small longitudinal uh, program can help to solve one uh, or at least address to some extent. I'm not saying that uh, you know there is no school dropout children in Nepal, but uh, it has helped a lot. To, to improve uh, school enrollment and keeping them in the in the school. Yurga, I just wanted to comment that I I asked Yurga to give us this step by step review of the process steps for one specific example. Of course, in our twenty five years, there are other examples as well. Um, but but I wanted everybody to have a sense of what the process was. Uh, yeah. I'll go back to the slides. Yeah, okay, can you go back to uh, one? Uh, I mean, I missed one point. I mean, this is for the children, not the forward, not but the backward. Yeah, if you uh, look at the second policy uh, policy brief that was done after six or seven years or even eight years. So what that means is from that experience, what we learn is if you can keep the girls in the school, that is likely to delay their marriage. So, I mean, early marriage was, uh, was a problem in Nepal. So the, the one solution or to that problem was keeping those girls in the school. So it, it, because it is a longitudinal study, we could do this uh, you know, analysis and then produce the findings and share with, with uh, stakeholders. And next, that is uh, generation of knowledge to produce evidence better to, to formulate evidence-based policy. Now I'm going to talk about the capacity building. Uh, I'm not showing here uh, the number of people and the building, but uh, what I, I wanted to communicate or tell you is most of these people had worked with us for more than 15 years. That gives an opportunity to train them in, on a, you know, starting from the basic research, uh, research task to a very complicated research, uh, you know, uh, data collection. So these people are there. 
there was no building and nothing. But uh, within this, you know, 25 years, uh, we were able to create the uh, infrastructure as well as the resources, human resources. Next. Here, I, I'm just showing pictures. I'm not <laughs> showing pictures uh, in the sense that because of this longitudinal nature of research, we keep adding different uh, new components on the, uh, our sample, which requires more and more skill. And then we are able to develop, like in the first uh, picture is simply paper and pencil uh, interview. Then, then we move gradually and do more and more complicated uh, data collection, uh, which is absolutely because of this longitudinal uh, research uh, and we were able to achieve this. Next. And then uh, one of the other caveat, uh, yeah, but Joe was uh, you know, uh, indicating it before, I, I don't know, before we start this um, webinar or before that. But one of the missing piece in low income country is those data are collected, but there is a lack of analytical skill. People cannot analyze them beyond some descriptive. And that does not give meaningful, uh, you know, meaningful of uh, result. So we started conducting survey data analysis workshop, first face to face. And then gradually we built this uh, you know, wonderful facility with generous support from one of our uh, alumni. He just passed away this year, but uh, anyway, uh, Albert uh, and Charlotte Anderson gave a donation to create this uh, long distance center. So uh, I, uh, it is not only helping Nepal, but this center has been Hub training hub for all South Asian, uh, you know, countries. People come to get uh, be trained in the uh, survey data analysis uh, here from uh, Bhutan, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, Sri Lanka, and other countries, other South Asian countries. So uh, it has been uh, served as a uh, a training hub uh, for South Asia. Uh, which is also another benefit. And then uh, we also, you know, it, it, it trans, you know, translating research finding to the practice is a you know, long way, long steps, long way to go. So what we do is we also disseminate our research finding through workshops, seminar, uh, and outreach program. I am putting here and in the first picture there are you know vice principal of planning commission and a very senior person in the government of Nepal and uh, yeah uh, those and it is um, these these uh, workshop are uh, thematic the first one was about social science and national building and yeah, second yeah. one is labor migration and uh, a by project. Yeah, Specific project is. Dear God, uh, I, I noticed that David Lamb is attending our webinar today. Uh, and I just want to make sure that he knows that we show a picture of him every time we speak about yeah. it. It's not just tonight yeah. because he's here. Um, uh, 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 and sorry, let me get one more slide in. If yeah, can. there is one more slide. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yep. That's all. Joe, that's, that's our slides. Oh, you're muted, Joe. Bill I, uh, and uh, Stephanie and Durga, thank you. I set kind of a high bar, and uh, I'm, I, I have to say you've greatly exceeded it. Um, uh, I, I have so many questions and, and energized reactions to your, uh, to your presentation, but let's open it up. I wonder if we could take down the slides, and I wonder if people could make generous use of the chat group um, or the question box, or even raise your hand and let your voice be heard. Uh, again, we're all about creating communities of practice and sometimes these uh, things happen uh, best with just uh, a verbal. Um, 
uh, I love Kevin's question here. Um, yeah, let me let me let me give Kevin a starting answer and let my colleagues uh, yeah. join in. Uh, Kevin, when I started working in Nepal, um, you'd, you'd go to talk to a household and they'd literally ask what program you were there to bring and want to judge their answers to your questions based on what it was you were going to give them. And uh, I've worked with a few anthropologists who uh, <clears throat> cite real similar uh, experiences of uh, sort of having a local population want to give you the answers you want to hear so they give what you're passing out. And so ironically, our starting measure, our starting message on launch of this study is we're not here to give you anything. We are, we are, we are here to hear your story. We're here to record your story and, and share it and, 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 you know, appropriately anonymized so that it could be used to um, better understand the life experiences of uh, you and your family and share those life experiences with, um, with, uh, with, with the scientific community. And so it's a bit ironic that, um, actually we got high success out of that. At the time, it was very different than what other people were telling local uh, folks. It definitely an advantage that the uh, American guy there could tell it in Nepalese face-to-face -face with human beings, not, uh, not sending somebody else to tell the story and not, not telling it in English and having it translated. Definitely a big deal that we stayed. I mean, Derga, I'm curious about your reactions to this question. I think one of the most sincere things was that we stayed and came back and kept asking and that I think both demographic and surveillance and longitudinal could deliver this, but our, our consistency of presence was yep. such a change from what everyone we knew in Nepal had experienced a donor program coming in and doing a pre-survey to decide whether this was the right community to launch their thingy thingy in or not. And they come and maybe they get the program or not, but they never see those researchers again. And so our consistency there helped a lot. Um, uh, Dirga and I had a lot of pressure from one of our local partners to pay, um, gosh, what would you call this? Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, personal fees to the people in charge in order to keep our to keep our science alive, and we refused, and we got thrown out, and that story made its way to every every respondent uh, through through the way that these things work in Nepal, and um, and through the armed conflict, uh, 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 Dr. Gamiri was uh, taken by Maoist separatists uh, on the back of a motorcycle with a bag over his head into the middle of nowhere to report to them exactly how it is we safeguard people's answers and prevent the government from getting these responses. And uh, apparently he had good enough answers to both keep him alive and the study going. Um, and so, you know, I feel like over the decades we were tested, our sincerity of purpose was tested over and over and over again. And the families in our study, uh, no. Uh, Durga, what, should, what did I miss? I think you cover, uh, yeah, yeah. A consistency, politi political neutrality, uh, and be, be frank, uh, be honest at the front. Like if you are not willing, that, that's fine with us, uh, but we are not here to give you any personal or individual benefits. It is, it, we will uh, we'll generate information We'll share that with the appropriate places. And then we hope that will return the benefit to, to all people, not only the community we study. That's how we, we have been uh, you know, uh, keeping data. And I think this is a really helpful, um, um, just for the benefit of people who can't maybe see all the question or chat comments, um, We'll just summarize some of the questions that come up, but that one, I have to say, I was so impressed with keeping people engaged, and I wondered what what the secret is, um, because um, I do my my experience in any setting, our setting, or particularly in places um, 
where there's a power differential, um, a person of privilege shows up um, in, a, in a place that has been deprived. The immediate question is, what's your agenda? How is this gonna benefit me? I'm just astounded that you can keep people engaged um, and and um, let me comment on another facet, though, Joe, yeah. because I think this is also terribly important. And Steph, you may wish to comment, but it is crucial to keep the burden low. We <laughs> every time we design a questionnaire, the number one question in our minds is how much time of our respondents life are we asking them for here? And, and what is our justification of purpose on that? You know, uh, we try to keep the question simple. We try to keep the, um, the uh, questionnaire length short. We try to keep the interviews uh, 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 easy. And I think that has a cumulative consequence in any of these longitudinal studies where if people's experiences with one wave is, oh my God, I can't believe they just made me do that. They just asked me to do all these things, or they just, you know, took my blood and spilled it all over my shirt. Not to pick a bad example, um, but, uh, but 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 whatever the thing might be, uh, I think that that negative side in these panel studies has a real uh, adverse consequence downstream. Could I um, just before we move on to another question from um, Cheryl Moyer? Could I just ask, have you studied why people engage with you? Um, and ask the questions of um, what's, what's the benefit to you of um, engaging with me as an interviewer? Why do you do this? I was astounded by, it does take 60 minutes of their time. What's the perception of the people who you're asking questions of? What do they think the value is? Do you know? So it, it is interesting, Joe. I mean, first of all, I do want to say that there's an entire science of this in survey methodology, and uh, and Stephanie gave us a window into that science with the, some of these uh, computer assisted tools and how they've evolved over time to make our work uh, more efficient, more effective, and uh, sort of protect the confidentiality of respondents in better ways. Um, and and that science, uh, which I'm on a caricature also is very context specific about um, both the benefit side, Joe, and the risk side and perceived value of the experience. In, in the United States, we pay people dollars. In Nepal, we discovered very quickly that um, that was setting specific, not appropriate. I, I suspect that by year 35 or 40, that may change, Joe. And for some purposes, uh, paying for people's time is considered reasonable and appropriate, and then getting the amount right is important. Um, at the time we launched, this was a very remote place where nobody really showed much care for the daily life experiences of the people we were interviewing. And, and, and that's one of the reasons why I believe in that specific context, the sincerity of, of the questioning, the persistence of staying there and, um, and the message that we just want uh, to, to record your story was successful by itself. I don't think that same tool set is successful across all settings and um, and, and then I guess the other thing that both Stephanie and Deirdre would remind me is that tool set of how to um, motivate a respondent to cooperate, an interviewer to do the task, the two of them to work together uh, has to change both for setting and for task. And so, um, you know, some kinds of tasks, I mean, I just used blood draws as an example uh, because it's controversial and difficult um, uh, to do at large scale. Uh, but that's a different task. Maybe the answer is different. Um, uh, Pam and I are working on, uh, on, on having Durga do some tests for us of air quality monitors in people's homes in Nepal, on people's wrists in Nepal. Uh, maybe the answer will be different. And so I think there is some need ahead of it to evaluate, okay, not just in this setting, but with this task, uh, how do you address both is it worth doing and is it a bad thing to have done? 
Can I say one other quick thing before we move on? I know there are other questions, um, but a final aspect of this, ISCRN is very fortunate in that, as Deirdre mentioned, they have this long-term staff, this very skilled, very competent, very impressive staff. Um, but even without that, it is super important that you are recruiting and hiring interviewers from the community in which you're working. In that way, respondents will be much more receptive to the survey request. And for example, in Chitwan, there are multiple ethnic backgrounds, multiple you know, languages. Um, and so the interviewing staff reflects all of that. And so you are able to send interviewers to respondents and there is a very kind of collegial you know, relationship there. The other piece of that is um, having extremely rigorous interviewer trainings. So interviewers are able to portray themselves as professional data collectors. They're able to answer correctly any questions the respondents have. They're able to engage with respondents in that you know, kind of defined interviewer role. And the respondents feel respected. Um, because they have somebody with those credentials, with that mannerism, coming to their home and asking them to participate. Thank you, Stephanie. Those are all great points. And uh, yeah, I mean, just to harp on it a bit, Joe, um, a survey research organization in general is not successful if the diversity of their staff does not match the diversity of the population they're studying in every respect. And so that's, that's a key ingredient for success in, in every setting, as far as I know. Uh, professionalism of staff is great. And I just thought you might enjoy that one of the ancient czars of training interviewers, a man named Charlie Cannell, described it to me as a doctor in the doctor's office asking you questions. If you set the right professional tone and situation and privacy and confidentiality, it turns out human beings will willingly take off their pants if that's what they're supposed to do. And, uh, and, and, you know, creating that professional environment is a cornerstone of, of excellent uh, interviewer training and supervision. Great. Maybe, Stephanie, while you, while you still have the microphone there, uh, kind of a technical question. Um, the, the actual platform for the data collection system that you use, and I, I have to admit, I was wondering that too, is this something you designed or it's proprietary where it's mm -hmm. based? And then I'd like to segue that into Pam's question about the long-term dependency of, of, of the infrastructure on, on the University of Michigan or, mm -hmm. or your, 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 your ability to design obsolescence into that and to a complete transfer. But maybe if you could start off with that, and I'm definitely gonna come back to Cheryl's question, but I thought we could keep this stream going for a bit. Mm -hmm. so, so that is um, an interesting point. The Survey Research Center is very well resourced. We have access to very sophisticated technical tools. The questionnaire platform that we use for most of our data collections is called Blaze or Blaze, and it was designed by Statistics Netherlands primarily as a you know, robust survey collection tool. It's used by most large statistical organizations around the world. Um, but it is a high level expensive tool. Um, and so that's what we use. And that's what we integrated with a sample management system, the survey track system that we designed and we built at SRC to meet the needs of our very complex, multifaceted projects. Um, and it evolved, um, we first started using it in 1999. It's been evolving since then. Um, and so those are the platforms that we train our partners to use. We provide lots of technical support on those platforms. Um, they are not tools that can easily just be handed over um, to our partners. And our staff in Nepal, um, because you know, we've worked with them for years across different projects, they have a very high level of skill. They now are able to, within our survey track system, to set up new projects on their own, to load laptops on their own, to extract data on their own, to run reports on their own. But we do still play a fairly strong role in setting up projects and training teams on how to do that. We do have other options. Um, for example, we have a couple of new projects where we're using a tool called Survey CTO, which is much simpler, much less robust. We don't have as much control over the functionality, 
but we can you know, build some more simple tools around it to provide at least some of these important elements of collecting paradata and running real-time reports and, and helping teams do this you know, real-time production management. But that is a good point, that these are pretty can sophisticated I, tools. Yep, can I add one more thing on that? I mean, um, we are just talking about uh, Michigan project uh, in ISCRN, but ISCRN in Nepal does several other projects that do not include Michigan involvement. And uh, some of those projects, uh, in, you know, programmer in Nepal, uh, uh, program the software, and we have conducted, uh, you know, simple, you know, short version of the surveys and other data collection. So it is not like, you know, it is completely dependent on Michigan. And if Michigan pull out, everything will collapse. It is not like that. There are other projects that ISCRN on, uh, you know, getting uh, funding uh, both from government of Nepal and also conducting some other types of research, uh, but not uh, at the scale that we have been talking here for, oh. you know, CBFS. Could, could I also, Dirga, because that was a point I very much wanted to make, Joe, particularly in response to Pam's question and how they're connected, right? Um, so Dirga told a story of building infrastructure over 25 years in two slides. Um, but <laughs> if you get let us do the 25 years uh, in 250 slides, <laughs> slides. Uh, we could show you a more granulated view of how you get from what Stephanie described, which really runs a key piece of the Chihuahua Valley Family Study, which connects a bunch of the longitudinal together, versus other studies, which use the same trained interviewer staff, which use the same understanding of how interviewer and respondent interact and how a computer assisted tool might help but might use different software that are cheaper or easier to get and, uh, and are not as robust as Stephanie mentioned. But Dirga, you, you made that University of Michigan, not University of Michigan thing. I think that's actually inaccurate. I think you do some studies for the University of Michigan that don't involve Blaze. Yep. Uh, for, for example, oh, yeah, we did a right, COVID right, right, survey right. very recently yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, right. and, and, and used a different tool set. And I think this is part of using the panel study to build infrastructure that creates independence and autonomy of the partner in, in Nepal, because he's describing to you a portfolio of, I think even now during COVID, you have four or five simultaneous field operations and we're just describing one of them to you. Uh, yep, where, right. where there are several of these others going on and might be using different tools for different ones. And part of what makes them attractive for these other studies is the fact that they also do this kind of work with us, but it, it also gives a kind of steady stream of tools and techniques and training that they can then use for other work. Yeah, I, um, I'm really tuned into the, the language of impact and I so appreciated um, Dirga's uh, walkthrough of just one example of, of of uh, dropouts from school and how to get at uh, causality there and start to address it, um, beautiful. Um, I can't help but wonder what other spinoff projects have come from this that maybe oh, don't yeah. directly involve the University of Michigan, but because of people you've trained or influenced that have gone on to do different things, um, I wish we could develop kind of a, a bit of attribution there. I, I know it's messy and complicated, but I can't help but think that there are other spinoff projects that are going from the people that are have been skilled up and trained because of this uh, uh, extensive work over time. So it's really impressive. Um, I, uh, I, I, boy, I'm, I'm intrigued by David's question that I know have, has caught the attention of several others. Have you tilted the scale uh, uh, by your presence in the area that suddenly you're, you're starting to alter the, the, what, you're, what, what you're actually getting feedback on? Um, what has been the impact of uh, what do we do when we distort the field, when we go in and we're looking and prowling and kind of camping out for a long period of time? 
my uh, my my friend uh, mentor uh, Robert Groves, who was my predecessor in the Survey Research Center here, but uh, 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 then ran the census and is now in George Georgetown as provost and a uh, member of the National Academy of Sciences, gave a lecture to me as a graduate student where he tried to tell us how do we weigh a potato. Uh, and you get a potato out and you put it on the scale and you call that the weight. And then you look at the potato and you see there's some dirt on there. And then you, you wash the dirt off. But when you wash the dirt off, a little bit of the potato skin comes off. And now you don't have the weight of the potato again. And, uh, and Joe, I'm the kind of person who believes if you put a thermometer in a beaker, it's going to change the temperature of whatever liquid was in there. Uh, I, I think for any of us to imagine that our, uh, our measurement uh, uh, processes have no consequences would be um, extraordinarily naive. Um, and, and, uh, and, and this from a person who, who, who was trained in anthropology where you know, my biggest concern was uh, anthropologist has a huge influence on the people uh, he or she is studying, but how do we measure that? Uh, I think uh, what's crucial here is to build in research design to measure and test for the consequences of your measuring. And, uh, and, and, I, and I think that's, that's crucial. Um, and uh, it, it is interesting. Uh, I have been um, uh, overweight for a lot of my life, Joe, and uh, worked with all kinds of little tools to try and, you know, magically help me stop eating stuff I shouldn't eat. Turns out human behavior is not as easy to manipulate as we might like to believe. And it turns out the simple act of asking questions doesn't cause as big a behavioral change as we might have hoped. Um, and, and I imagine that's part of the practitioner's life uh, constantly is trying to figure out how to affect uh, more human behavioral change. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be worried about it. I think David's question is, is correct and other people um, uh, uh, joined it because of the obvious issues uh, with the potential for your measurement to have influenced the people you're studying. Um, in most of these designs, longitudinal designs, my favorite way to address it is to have uh, subsequent panels or sub panels that have not been in the study for as long a time to test that same thing. It's one of the reasons that we refresh the sample periodically with new residents, both to make sure it's representative of the population, but to remove some of the conditioning of having been in the study for a longer period. Um, it is also the case that the Chitwan Valley family study is uh, a compilation of a lot of different research topics. And so a person who's been in it for these 10 years will have experienced different topics than a person who's been in those 10 years. Of course, just like every other research problem, there's a bunch of other differences between those two cohorts of people also. And so it's not a simple question to address. I think it'd be terribly naive not to design around it and very important to, to, to always consider that uh, a possibility and to try to design for it. That said, I also think that Stephanie's comments about the professionalism of the interviewer staff and the, and the um, robustness of your tools for making sure that the interviewer staff behaves in ways that's completely neutral is very important uh, over time. Uh, Dirga mentioned political neutrality as part of our success story. That's because politics has been volatile in Nepal to the point of armed conflict. And in any of those situations, uh, our mission was to tell the story, not to take a side. Uh, but I think it's a little bit that way with all the measurement. Uh, uh, you know, whether you're measuring people's attitudes, uh, we mounted a large scale of mental health. Uh, we're, we're not there to, to make a judgment. We're there, just there to record it, it, it. I think you have to, I guess that's my way of saying you should attend to it in overall design and then you have to tend to it every single day in how you act and, and how the staff engages with, with folks in the setting. Um, Can I add one more thing? Um, David, I don't have an exact answer to your question at this moment, but we have started it like, you know, we drew another sample, a representative sample of Western Chiton for another study. And we hope, uh, you know, if there is any significant influence of our panel uh, that should be different from what our new sample uh, is. 
there is a, some overlap between the new sample and our CBFA sample, but we do have that distinctness uh, and we, uh, yeah, we could investigate uh, that uh, in the future. Yes, we have not done it. Uh, I simply compare uh, the descriptives and they look very similar, but not, uh, you know, uh, in a There's way, a lot of wells. Uh, this, yeah, yeah. It, it's interesting. Yeah. Jirga, you mentioned the uh, demographic and health surveys in your uh, op opening remarks uh, to your presentation, and uh, of course, there there are a family of these surveys from Nepal, also Joe. So there's these opportunities to take metrics measured in the Chitwan Valley Family Study and yeah. and compare them to other nationally representative studies in Nepal to ask the question: Well, are we seeing? Um, but, but, but because the data are sort of unique in the Chihuahua Valley Family Study and this, this long-term chain of data, if you will, is somewhat unique, it's harder to test the longitudinal associations that way without having a fresh cohort and a new panel. Yeah, and I know some of this has to do with um, where we start asking the questions. Um, being a dean in the medical school, I'm, I've often been frustrated by the fact that we measure our school or our Michigan medicine by all kinds of rankings, but I think the most important ranking would be, um, is the population we care for healthier uh, than others? I mean, I think that would be the most important parameter. And if CHIT1 was designed just for health, the question would be, well, after all this time and all this money, is the health of Chitwan Valley better than others? And uh, wow. complicated, messy, but I wanted to use that as a lead in to uh, Garub's question. Um, why Chitwan? Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I, wanna, I, wanna, I wanna underscore what you just said for a second though, Joe, because I went and told respondents on launch, we're not gonna help you specifically. We're going to ask you to tell us your story. We're going to record this, and we're going to hope that that has an impact on policies and programs somewhere. Maybe not here. Maybe sure. not Chihuahua. So, so interestingly, Chihuahua Valley Family Study was not set up to be for Chihuahua Valley to be the understood the beneficiary in some sense. Understood. You know, in some sense, it was it was set up. To answer Garub's question and, and the one you emphasized, um, there were a couple factors that made Chitwan ideal for our original purposes. Our original purposes were to study family change. And particularly, um, there was a lot of worldwide study of family change, but they that most of that research compares very different cultures, very different settings that are that are different in multiple ways. So if you compare India to Thailand, uh, you might find some Buddhists both places, but uh, but you find both you know the religious culture quite different in the two settings, and uh, and the economy quite different in the two settings. And so we wanted to get a setting in which the basic culture was homogeneous, but the socioeconomic change was spreading through that setting in a way that created very local levels of variation. And we wanted to have this homogeneous overall culture, but allow the variety of ethnic groups that are in Nepal to be near each other. And uh, I don't know how much either group or you know about the history of Chitwan. Uh, Joe, I think you've been. Um, but uh, uh, Chitwan was a forested area inhabited by a group called the Taru until uh, Nepalese government with help from USAID uh, bulldozed about two thirds of the forest and sprayed DDT from the air and created a resettlement area in the late 1950s. And, and then handed out land parcels. And in handing out land parcels, um, uh, folks came from the hills and mountains north of Chitwan from all different ethnic groups, from all different kind of situations to get these land parcels and settled in Chitwan. And that gave Chitwan a kind of uh, homogeneous socioeconomic starting point with some ethnic variation spread throughout. And Deirga and I have collected these wonderful stories from people who live in the most remote corners of Chitwan Valley. And we ask them, why'd you build your house here? And they said, well, when we moved here, we thought this was gonna be where the city was. Um, 
And so people had very little control over where the city actually wound up and where a lot of services wound up. By the time we selected it, there was a city on one side and a very geographically distinct spread of schools, health posts, uh, job opportunities, uh, 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 several of the kind of factors that we knew from research globally were very strong influences on family change, particularly the kind of things I mentioned, marriage, childbearing, contraceptive use, these type of things. And so Chitwan was chosen for research design purposes. It gave us a controlled comparison, a, a single uh, population in a contiguous setting, but with very different localized experiences of schools and health services and access to jobs and, uh, and, and other kinds of stuff. And, uh, and, that's, and that's why. Great. Um, could you, um, could, could someone from the group speculate on, it seems so much has again been dependent on support and um, I guess the, the promise of long-term funding. So it sounds like your, your good work has been rewarded by quite a bit of outside funding. Um, <laughs> could you I was gonna say my good work was report, rewarded by more work. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's what Deirdre or Stephanie would say as well. You know, uh, we have had NIH support for 26, 28, maybe 30 years now. We've had NIH support. It did not come in one giant 30 year bucket of here's a bunch of cash. It came in proposal after proposal after proposal after proposal being written, peer reviewed, scored, and some of them got funded. And, and it's an interesting point about sort of content and, and innovation um, because the NIH review criteria prioritize scientific innovation. So it's very difficult to run a panel study where you say, well, we're gonna go back and do five more years of the same thing that we did for the last 20. It's very hard to get such a thing uh, funded. Um, uh, there has to be sort of constant sources of innovation and change within the study to secure that kind of uh, support. So we've had really good fortune with NIH, but it was a whole bunch of work in lots of little pieces, not one big piece. Could you, could you speculate the, on, the, on the future of that? If we're thinking about as a center or as a, a community of practice at University of Michigan, thinking about setting up other long-term platforms like this, um, what do you think the future is for funding? long-term initiatives, um, again, in, in pieces, but is this um, a strategy, if we build it, they will come, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to get funding, um, or some of, the, some of us are worried about the short-term um, uh, approach to funding saying, no, we wanna see deliverables within a couple of years here is really limited um, the, the long-term view that I think you've taken uh, in Chitwan. And maybe match of agenda to funding agency is crucial here, Joe. So, so uh, I, I do think these panel studies world, worldwide have benefited by a relationship with the National Institutes of Health. And one reason is because National Institutes of Health is prepared to make somewhat longer term investments with the payoffs not as narrowly defined as deliverables. However, the demand that I think to be pretty continuous at NIH is, what is the really important unanswered question that you're going to answer? And to me, that, that package has a bunch of pieces. Is this question really important? You know, what's the significance? Can you really answer it? Is your approach going to be better than anybody's approach has ever been before? And those things were part and parcel of our motivation not to sacrifice quality for uh, expediency and not to allow, um, well, you know, I had spent a lot of years in Nepal hearing Nepalese very frustrated with Americans and other foreigners who come there to do research to benefit themselves and walk away and are willing to do it at a lower quality standard than they would be able to do it in their own country. I think I've told you this story before, um, sort of uh, uh, folks who would say to me stuff like, well, you just come to work in Nepal because you can't get work in the United States. 
and I, and I think, uh, I think holding ourselves to those same standards of quality helped with NIH. NIH helped us accomplish these goals. Um, I think the, you know, the scientific themes of the study have had to evolve in increments as stuff is learned. I, I'm very excited to be working with Pam now on uh, air quality because I think the tools to measure air quality have evolved so much. It allows us to answer new questions that haven't been answered before and those are very important. I suspect that that's true across a lot of the University of Michigan. I, mean, I think the great thing about having the University of Michigan as a hub for these platforms is I cannot imagine the scientists of the University of Michigan running out of important new questions to answer with data. Uh, and so that seems to me like a piece of the fuel to make sure that 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 funding arrives. Um, and let me comment one other thing about the academic partnership, which isn't for everyone, but I think just as Deirga's frustration with implementation without science got him to join us, I think one 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 reason that we're motivated to do this is um, first of all. Publisher parish isn't a joke. Um, yeah, and, and I think peer review of our proposals to conduct research is a wonderful step to okay. making sure that your the research you do with that money is successful and being publishable. And so, you know, I think in some sense, uh, a good match between partners, academic and implementation, um, where there's some goals that are in common. I, 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 I think it worked in Nepal. I think it can work other places. Maybe if I could end up with uh, just one question, and I'll ask one for maybe I'll I'll start with Durga on this one. Um, really successful at um, at great rigor, um, often defined by NIH and peer peer research. Um, so crucial. I mean, we're an academic institution. We need to do that to survive without apology. But Suzanne asks, I think, a really piercing question. Um, what would folks in Nepal say are examples of benefits to the communities who are participants? You know, so we're meeting, you're meeting NIH criteria. Um, are, there, are there examples um, from the Nepali viewpoint? Um, boy, this work has been really valued by us, we're better off because of that. Do, do things come to mind? This is, uh, yeah, again, it, it comes to a different level. As Bill already said, at the study population level, it may not be that you know, visible and people may not take it the same, same way as do in regional or national level. Yes, national level, our data has been used by you know, students in the national universities. Um, you know, the, that has been used for uh, course development. And people, you know, a lot of people come to our training session. The training session has been so popular. I could not uh, accommodate more than 20% uh, you know, uh, applicant in our training session in Nepal. And uh, I have been uh, consulted for various, uh, you know, universities, new, new universities are coming. And then I have been consulted. I have been member of uh, universities uh, uh, consortium. And uh, plus there are other scientists, uh, ISCR in itself, uh, the development of our uh, collaborative uh, program has been a platform for researcher, young researcher who could be trained in US or Germany or some uh, other countries, could come to ISCR and write proposal and get funded and then launch their own research. That has been done and that has been going on. Uh, so yeah, poverty has been very uh, so, you know, instrumental. Can I ask you, we're, we're about to run out of time. Could you mention just a couple examples of government agencies in Nepal who, who, who consult with you about data to solve specific problems? Mental health or uh, child health, or I mean, you've been active in all these domains. Uh, could you just give yeah. a few examples of those kind of things? Yeah, Nepal, uh, Nepal Health Research Council wanted to launch a mental health study in Nepal and they raised to, uh, to us and get some advice from us. 
and they launched their own uh, mental health studies uh, in Nepal. Uh, a similar way, now they now the government has instituted new uh, new uh, think tank they call it, and I have been actively involved in in that uh, you know uh, forming that uh, group. Uh, so there are several occasions, and especially I would say the number one benefit to Nepal would be you know data, uh, this training, and uh, policy briefs uh, that goes to the national level. Uh, I have been consulted by National Planning Commission, and they wanted to you know read our policy briefs and work on uh, you know, design this new policy. Uh, yes. So uh, at, at individual or uh, community level, uh, I given one example of, uh, you know, out of children education. There are other examples like that. For example, we also conducted, a, you know, it was ecological research and we conducted a intervention to control uh, invasive species. That is taking, that was, take, that is still taking over all the natural, national park and community forest. And we work with the community, teach them uh, the appropriate technology to, you know, to control the mechanism uh, and invasive species in the forest. So, yeah. Joe, so just some, one, some one, one comment about why Dirga's uh, research briefs have been so important in Nepal. Nepal is a setting, and, and I think many of your other countries may have a similar characteristic, but Nepal is a setting that's very popular with donor agencies. There's bilateral donors from almost every country. There's multilateral donors, almost all of them are in Nepal trying to do something. And so there's tons of NGOs and INGOs all with a mission, you know, and to have some research-based evidence that has a peer review publication behind it helps government of Nepal get those donors to line up on the same page to get something done. Well, this has just been outstanding. Um, Unfortunately, um, we have to wrap it up, but you left, you've left us hungry for much more. I know you've only scratched the surface and um, interviewed Next week, us next week we just do it again, that's the point? Yeah. No, no, yeah. Um, I do want to acknowledge that, you know, Cheryl asked a question about challenges. And when I heard of Durga on a motorcycle with a hood over him, and then being reminded of Garuba about the civil war that Nepal had to work its way through, I'm sure there's a whole um, book of, of challenges that it hasn't been easy. But congratulations on just an incredible body of work that we're just beginning to understand and want to appreciate further. I, I think there's a lot of lessons for us at the center in terms of how we collaborate and how do we uh, design, co-design for impact um, with, uh, with individuals and groups in low-income settings. So congratulations on uh, giving us some snapshots of what it looks like. And uh, uh, I know uh, I and others will be reaching out with other uh, questions and uh, uh, areas of potential collaboration. Um, uh, thanks everyone for, uh, for being with us uh, this evening. And uh, again, uh, please check our website. We're, we're gonna be respectful of the summertime that we're in. So um, this is the concluding uh, seminar until our fall time period. But, uh, but again, a special thanks to Durga, to Stephanie, Bill, for your uh, leadership on this seminar and uh, really grateful for what you've shared with us. So thank you and uh, good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.